We're so grateful, Lord, and uh, we don't even have really the words to express our gratitude. And so I pray that you'll help us express our gratitude with our very lives and that we'll go deeper in that today as we devote ourselves completely and wholly to you and to your name, your powerful, healing, mighty name. It's in that name that we are even able to pray this prayer right now. Amen. Go ahead and have a seat and um, take your Bibles and turn to the book of 2 Timothy. And while you're doing that, um, can I push a couple of opportunities? Is that all right? You know, um, trunk or treat is a pretty big deal. Um, Not because it's on Halloween or it's around Halloween. It doesn't even have anything to do with Halloween. You hear us say all the time that it is a non-spooky alternative to Halloween. Um, And we have the opportunity to have hundreds of people on our campus next Sunday night that we can love on our kids in our community, the families in our community with the hope. There's only one reason we do it. It's so that God will give us opportunities and platforms to speak Jesus into those situations, into those families, and into the hearts of the children in hopes that maybe someday, as they experience the love of God's people on this campus, they might be able to come and experience the love of Jesus. And that's why we do it. Um, We've got, you're doing a great job. We have, I think, 22 to 25, something, 25, I think it's 25, 24, 25 trunks you know, the groups of people, you life groups and all are jumping in. But we need some help. Um, I think they said we need about 25 volunteers to help with other than trunk things. Um, so we need help with some carnival games and different um, food trucks and those kinds of things. So if you can help us out, um, and you're not uh, signed up for something or your life group's not participating um, as a life group, then I would really encourage you to just uh, either stop by the the uh, Connection point, or you can go online and volunteer. That would be a, a big help to us. Here's another thing that's pretty, pretty cool. Um, have you heard of the um, Courageous movie? A powerful movie. And there's another movie out called Show Me the Father that is a very powerful movie. Um, especially both of these movies directed towards... Um, what could be a massive crisis in the world, and that is the absenteeism of fathers and uh, godly fathers and men who would just step up and leave their homes. And there's a family in our church that has a burden. Um, Actually, they remade Courageous, the movie. So it's the same movie, but um, they remade it and updated it, same thing, and some kind of dynamic ending. I have not seen the ending um, that that they added to it. Well, um, one family in the church, they don't want anybody to know who they are. They just said, um, we think these are so powerful that we're going to um, rent Linway Plaza Theater and, uh, for, on two nights and show Courageous one night and show, the, show Me the Father um, the other night. This is November the 2nd. They're both Tuesday night, November the 2nd and November the 9th. And they said, um, we want to buy all, they're, they're buying the whole house. So they're buying 300, I think 350 um, seats in the, in the theater. And we want to give those to anyone at the church who wants to go or has somebody they think should be able to take a take to see the movie. So these tickets are available. They're free to you. They paid for them. They had to pay to rent the whole theater. Um, the only thing is, and I think it's, it's honorable for us to honor their wishes, that Um, If you get a ticket that you either use it or you give it away um, and have somebody use it because they're paying for each and every one of these tickets. What What a wonderful ministry to do to make that available to us, to strengthen us as families, but also you might know a family that you can invite to one of these nights. You can pick these tickets up. They're at the connection point. You can go and pick them up and use them, and let's just see what powerful things God has done, and God bless this family who's willing to Uh, spend the money to make that happen. Um, I hope that it makes a big difference for us. Okay. Hey, guess who's in the house? Linnell Smith. Linnell, stand up and just wave to everybody. This is Linnell. She is our missionary to Ecuador, and she's home for a couple of weeks, and it's so good to have you here. 
And um, we're going to get to hear some great things that you're doing, uh, the, the way the Lord is, is leading you, and you're going into some new endeavor I haven't heard about yet, um, but we'll, we'll get caught up. But it's good to have you here in our midst today, and thank you for the work that you're doing over there in Ecuador. ABWE is um, who she's a missionary with, and so thankful for you. Okay, today we're going to continue our discussion about fear. You okay with that? All right, well, if you're not, we're going to do it anyway, but we're going to, we're going to march on down through here. We're in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, is um, where our text is from. We talked last week, this is our working definition of fear, a distressing emotion aroused by the anticipation, the anticipation of pain, harm, or loss. We all agreed last week on this statement, I think I have it in your notes, that fear doesn't live in the present and uncertain, or uncertain. it lives in the future and uncertain. I just slaughtered that, so let me say it again. Fear doesn't live in the present and certain, fear lives in the future and uncertain, which is where most of us get stuck, is right there. We totally get overwhelmed sometimes, frozen in our tracks, it paralyzes us over the fact that we do not have control of the uncertain future that is out ahead of us or the circumstances sometimes that we find ourselves in. But here's the big picture. You, and we're talking to believers here, you who are in Jesus Christ, you have nothing to fear. And we sat in that moment last week and it really sunk in. You need to hear that message. No matter what your circumstance, no matter what you're in the middle of right now that might seem hopeless, it's not. And you have nothing to fear. And that's what Paul, writing to a young, timid Timothy, a young pastor, wanted him to hear and therefore wants all of us to hear in verse seven where he says, Timothy, God has not given us the spirit of fear. I don't know what you're afraid of. I don't know why you're so timid. I don't know exactly everything happening in your life. But the message for you here today is God has not given you the spirit of fear. Instead, what he has given to us is power, love, and self-discipline. So here it is. If you are predisposed or you have a pattern of thinking that results in constant debilitating fear in response to the circumstances in your life or the relationships in your life or what's going on in your head, that's not from God. That's the message here. If your life is characterized, like mine is sometimes, by worry and ulcers and insomnia and the wringing of the hands about all that's going on and you don't, you're not sure about tomorrow and you don't know what's all going to happen and you have all forms of anxiety as a result of this fear, all of that is not from God. And we're not supposed to be people like that because we have been changed. We are in Jesus Christ and because of that, you and I have nothing to fear. I love the passage that says, what can mere men do to me? I'm a child of God. How awesome is that? And what we find here in this passage is that God has given us a supernatural prescription for fear. And it is power, love, and self-control. Last week, we talked about the first one, power for circumstances. And we said that sin in the world gave us the disposition and propensity to fear, to doubt, to worry about things that we can't control, but you are not what you used to be, and we all need to understand that. You're a new creation, the old is gone, the new has come, and you possess, I freaked you, some of you guys, some of you guys who don't know my past, you just freaked out. You don't know how special fire is and how I handle fire. You don't understand how that is. You and I possess the dunamis, dunamis, the power of the Holy Spirit of God over fear, over your circumstances, over your bad relationships. And we need to realize that it's just not, you just have some strength. You have power 
over those things. And I'm not even going to light that <laughs> this week. But we're, I'm going to tell you in just a second how you can light the fuse of that power so that you can use it. We learned what happened, and we're not going to go into this whole thing in, uh, about the people of Israel in Numbers chapter 13. Remember, we talked about that last week, and we saw what happens when God's people are fearful instead of faithful as they assess the uncertainty that is before them. And we watched all of that unfold, how the, ten, the 12 spies went to seek the land, and when they came back with the report, two were courageous and full of faith, and the other 10 were doubtful and full of fear. We watched while Joshua and Caleb pled with the people. I think I'm gonna have it on the screen, Numbers 14, nine. And they say to the people, folks, do not rebel against the Lord and don't be afraid of the people of this land. And what we learned last week, and I want to reemphasize today, is that fear that results in faithlessness is rebellion against the Lord. That's the message here. Joshua and Caleb are saying, listen, people, listen. Do not rebel against the Lord in your unfaithfulness, in your lack of faith. See, sometimes we allow fear to get in and stop us from trusting the Lord. It's not that you're afraid that it's a rebellion against the Lord. It's what you do, what the fruit of your fear results in that is in rebellion to the Lord because it says, God, you don't have the strength and power to help me. This is the fruit of the spirit of fear. They said, those people in that land are helpless, pray to us. They have no protection, but the Lord is with us. Don't be afraid of them. And instead of the people going, you're right, Joshua and Caleb, what were we thinking? Yes, we'll follow that strength and the truth in that message. And instead, the scripture says, unbelievably, they picked up stones and said, let's stone these guys and just get rid of them. The guys who were full of faith and optimism who were saying, we can do this. You don't need to be afraid. And speaking truth, instead of believing those guys, they believed the liars and they wanted to stone the good guys. Who does that? Fearful people. It's the fruit of the spirit of fear. Look at it, I think it's in your notes. Let's jump, I'm gonna move through these, okay? Here's what the spirit of fear does that we can find in that story. It embraces the negative. We begin to listen to the unfaithful. We listen to the unbelieving, the faithless voices of the weak. How many of you have some of those people in your lives? How many of you, you know God has something for you to do. You know you gotta try and do some big thing for God and it's testing your faith and you're a little bit of afraid and you always will have the voices, the negative voices says, no, you can't, no, you shouldn't. Don't think, did you think about this? You're going down if you do that. You can't handle it. We will always have those voices with us. And that's the spirit of fear that embraces the negative. Here's another thing the spirit of fear does. It enlarges the enemy's threat. You remember the story? Here's the report. Everyone in the land are giants. True or false? False. false. Were there some giants there? Absolutely. Would that make you afraid? Yes. But what we do is we enlarge the enemy's threat when we're afraid. That's what the spirit of fear does. Oh, everybody's giants. They think we're grasshoppers. No, they don't. That's in your head. You don't know that to be true. They're gonna drag all of our children away and devour us and kill our children. Does that happen to you like in the night? It happens to me at like three o'clock, four o'clock in the morning where I wake up and the thing that's on my mind, the thing I'm worried about, the thing that I'm nervous about, the thing that I'm fretting over, looms larger than life. And I lay there and the thing is giant 
and it gets bigger and bigger. My friends, that is not of God. That is, that is not the spirit of power. That is the spirit of fear. That is the fruit of, spear, of, of, of fear that enlarges the enemy's threats. Here's another thing the spirit of fear does. It engages our anxiety. Bringing out in the open that which is stored in our hearts and minds and we actually act upon it. What was the solution for the people of Israel? Here's what it was. Let's get rid of our leaders and let's go back to Egypt. Have they lost their minds? Give me the whip to my back. It's better than facing something that almighty God can handle and fight for me. Listen. Oh, my word. If you're afraid about our economy, if you're afraid about our world, if you're afraid about pandemics, if you're afraid about, can I just tell you something? You can take that story and you can march all the way down through everything that's happening in our world today, not just the, Amer the United States of America, in our world today where they are twisting the truth, they're telling us lies, they're making things bigger and looming larger only to get God's people and all people anxious and excited and freaking out, losing their minds, and we can't even think straight anymore. We all want to run back to Egypt to, and can take the whip to our back instead of march faithfully into the future, into the unknown, uncertain future, because God is ahead of us and taking care of us. God's people are not supposed to live in the fruit of fear, Amen. even in the face of uncertain death. We march forward, my friends, Amen. because God is with us. And even if they take our life, what do we care? What is our life? It's nothing. It's here today. It's gone tomorrow anyway. You don't know if you have tomorrow. And if God wants to take me faithfully following him, so be it. Take me home, Lord. For me to live is Christ, but to die is gain, my friends. What are you afraid of? You have nothing to be afraid of. You have nothing to fear. You know what the result of forfeiting, um, the result of fear and unfaithfulness, um, it actually forfeits God's blessing and God's protection. See, the end of the story is tragic. Because of their unfaithfulness and unwillingness to trust in the Lord, after seeing the mighty, miraculous miracles they saw with their own eyes, in the living flesh, they saw it with their own eyes, the miracle, the powerful miracles of God. Because they were, un, they were faithless, because of their fear, God says to them, okay, well, um, none of you 20 years and older are going to get to take the land that I have promised you. And I'm going to send you because of your, in, your unwillingness to hear the voices of truth because of your unwillingness to do what I have asked you to do, your consequence is going to be that you're going to wander in the wilderness for 40 years until everyone 20 years and older who could have made the right decision here dies. Oh, and those children that you're concerned about, that you're afraid I can't take care of, those children will possess the land. I will give the promised land that I wanted you to have, the land flowing with milk and honey, the blessed land. I will give it to your children instead of you. And 40 years later, after wandering through the wilderness, when all have died who could have made the right decision, everybody except Joshua and Caleb died and did not realize the blessing that God had. Paul David Tripp, in his book, Dangerous Calling, he writes this. Fear can overwhelm your senses. It can distort your thinking. It can kidnap your desires. It can capture your meditation so that you spend more time worrying about what could be than considering the God who is. 
Fear can cause you to make bad decisions in the short term and fail to make good decisions in the long run. Fear can cause you to forget what you know and to lose sight of who you are. Fear can make you wish for control you will never have. It can cause you to distrust people you have reason to trust. It can cause you to be demanding rather than serving. It can cause you to run when you should stay and to stay when you really should run. Fear can make God look small and your circumstances loom large. Fear can make you seek from people what you will only get from the Lord. And here it is, horizontal fear cannot be allowed allowed to rule your heart because if it does it will destroy you and your ministry you and i must light the fuse of the spirit of power that god has given to us because the spirit of power embraces the promises that's how you light the fuse of god's power how do i use this power here's the first thing you do embrace the promises of god when all had died and they have done with their wilderness wandering, in Joshua chapter one, on the eve of the departure to take the land that God promised to the people of Israel, God says to Joshua, do not be afraid. Isn't that interesting? Takes him right back to 40 years before, Joshua, don't be afraid. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. That isn't just some kind of Joshuan covenant. That is, that is for all God's people because he says, I am with you. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. And just like I have been with all of my other faithful servants, I will be with you. You have nothing to fear. Do not be afraid. Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble, but do not be troubled by that. Take heart, I have overcome the world. And because I have overcome the world and I am in you, then you are overcomers and there is nothing that can overtake you because you are in me. Amen. And we're to embrace those promises. My friends, Ephesians 3.20 says that God has plans by the power that is at work within us to exceedingly and abundantly beyond all you can ask or imagine take care of any situation that you find yourself in. Lighting the fuse of God's power starts with embracing the promises of God. Here's the other thing we have to do. Engage your support system. That's how you light the fuse of God's power. Engage your support system. The body of Christ exists so that we can bear each other's burdens. There's 50 plus one another things in the Bible where it says love one another, take care of one another, carry one another's burdens. The Bible actually says when you carry one another's burdens, you actually fulfill the law of Christ. One brother came up after the service a couple weeks ago and he's just, just, just full of anxiety about his life. And he's trying, and he's, he's saying, brother, I'm trying, I'm trying to do what I, the Lord wants me to do. It's just so hard. And my first question to him was, who's walking beside you in this? Every single one of us, we need a brother or sister in Christ who will walk beside us when we're faithless in order to speak the truth into us. And when we are weak, they will be strong. And some, someday they're going to be weak and we're going to be strong because of their strength someday that we took part in. And we're going to be able to help them. And that's what carrying one another's burdens is all about. Amen. You have been given the wonderful thing of the body of Jesus Christ to support you during your hard time of faithlessness. When your faith is weak and you want to be fearful and all kinds of horrible things are happening in your life, that's when you need to engage the body of Christ more than ever before. Here's what I want to tell you, though. I love getting strong in peacetime so that when wartime comes, you already have built up a reserve of strength. So get involved with God's people today. Build those relationships strong. And whenever you're in your time of need and crisis, they will be there for you. I can attest to that. And here's the last thing. In order to light the fuse of the power of God, you need to exercise your faith. And we do that by calling out the lies and proclaiming the truth into our circumstances. Do you believe? Do you believe that what God has said in his word is true? Well, then you need to act on that and not listen to the lies of the enemy. Ah! We're like grasshoppers. No, you're not. You're actually children of the living God. 
That's who you are. Speak that. You're children of the Most High God, and he has promised you a land flowing with milk and honey. He has promised you life abundantly, abundant life in Jesus Christ. Now, is it going to be hard? Yes, it's going to be hard. Do we have trials? Yes, Jesus actually said. He didn't, he didn't pretend. You know, whenever we go whining sometimes to him, he's like, son, I never promised you a rose garden. Actually, you already had that, and you screwed it up. You ate the apple. (laughs) Listen, if you and I will live and immerse ourselves in truth and meditate on God's promises, the Bible says that fear will flee from you because the truth sets us free. And that's what we, we have nothing to fear. You are a child of God. So he's given us power for our circumstances. Now, some of you might be saying, (laughs) Okay, Phil, enough of that, because I'm not so much afraid of my uncertainty and my circumstances. It's people I'm afraid of. Aren't we all? (laughs) I'm afraid of you. It's scary out there. It's a problem because we're all people. I'm afraid of people. Yeah, well, you're one of them. And every single one of us, all of us, are broken. We're messed up. We're fickle. And we're not like Jesus. Jesus. And we all have relational fears because we have relational problems. And we have relational problems because people live with us on this planet. But thank the Lord, we don't have to fear our relationships. We have been given love for our relationships. Can I take you back? to why we fear uncertain circumstances and outcomes in our lives, if, if, you, if you kind of drift it off, come back right now because you need to hear this, okay? Because this is directly connected to why we have relational problems. The reason that we fear uncertain circumstances and outcomes in our lives is because of our never-ending desire to control everything and to control everyone in our lives driven by our obsession for our own well-being and comfort. And that is what gets in the way of our relationships and that's why we have relational problems because people are selfish. I know, Phil. I know. My wife, you would not believe how selfish. (laughs) My husband, some of you are like, hmm. I'm not talking to anybody but you. People are selfish. You and I are selfish to the bone. We are. I've sat with people and say, and they they look at me and say, no, I'm not, and I say, you're a liar. (laughs) You're born that way. You pop out of the womb that way. And we spend the rest of our days until Jesus takes us home fighting that selfishness, putting ourselves on the throne of ours and everyone else's lives. And our relational fears are born out of our relational problems, and most of our relational problems are driven by somebody's selfish desires that are climbing to the top of everything, and it ruins us in relationships. And you might be like, seriously, Phil? Every relational, every single relational problem that we have with people is because somebody, and most of the time it's probably you and me, where we allow our selfishness and our desire to control everything for our own comfort and ease rise to the top of the relationship, and when that happens, everything falls apart. It's great for you as long as everyone's doing what you want, but as soon as people start not doing what you want and you're not getting your way, relational problems. Am I speaking truth here this morning? 
And I'm talking to myself because it's true for all of us. What can I get out of the relationship? Sometimes that's how we, we jump in. How can she, he or she meet my emotional and physical needs? You see this actually in its purest form in dating relationships. You know, the guy, he gets all dressed up and everything, you know, uncharacteristically. Tries to put on some cologne and he says, oh, baby, I love you so much. No, he does not. Oh, how you're so heartless, Phil. No, I'm not. It's reality. He does not love. That 15-year-old, that 16-year-old guy does not love your girl. He doesn't. He only has one thing on his mind. And he's calling it love. Oh, if you, and then he, then he does this. Then he plays this game. If you love me, you'll do this for me. What is that? There's no love going on when you are trying to manipulate or engage in some kind of ungodly activity. We had a rule in our house. You can have a boyfriend and a girlfriend. You can even go with each other. I remember when it first came out that we're going out. I'm like, no, you're not. What does that mean? We're going out. I said, no, you're not. What does that mean? I have a boyfriend. Well, then call it that. Don't call it going out because you're not going out because we had a rule in our home. You can never be alone with a person of the opposite sex if you call them your boyfriend or your girlfriend. I said, you guys can date, but you have to group date. Man, did I take some heat for that because there were some parents that were like, what are you thinking? What is wrong with you? I can't believe that you would, are you kidding? I'm like, are you kidding me? I am not putting my daughter in a car with your 15, 16 year old boy and say, go have a great time tonight. Never gonna happen. Well, why not? Because I don't trust your son. I know what he wants, and I know what he's after. And I wouldn't let your daughter sit in my son's car alone and go out somewhere at night. Why not? Because I don't trust my son. <laughs> you know the only safe date? I hope that you guys who have young teenagers are listening here. Because I'm giving you some really good stuff. <laughs> you're going to fight some battles, but I'm giving you some really good stuff. You want to protect your kids from sexual sin, which causes sexual fear in the future and distrust in the future? Whose idea was dating anyway? You let them date in a group. Because if you're with a group of people, you'll never do what you will do in the darkness in the backseat of a car somewhere in front of all those people. And if you would, you're really messed up and you need Jesus. I'm serious about that. Man, that was a weird side thing, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. Okay, back to the script. God has given us the need for love, he really has. Okay, so what that boy is doing, what that girl might be doing in that dating relationship is fulfilling a natural thing that God has given to us. He really has. He's given us the need for love. But our sinful nature has distorted that. And that's why we have so many relational problems. But I want you to listen to me loud and clear. God has supernaturally given us in Christ the capacity to love in a different way. God has no desire for us to fear entering into our relationships with others because he has given us love as a prescription for broken, fearful relationships. Write this down somewhere. There is nothing happening in your life relationally that love cannot overcome and conquer. Of course, we're talking about agape love here. 
There's three kinds of love. We've gone over this before, so I'll do it really quick. There's three kinds of love described in the scriptures. One is phileo love, which is brotherly love. And one is eros love, which we get our word erotic from. It is sexual or sensual love. Both of those kinds of loves are natural. Both of those kinds of love exist. Both of those kinds of love can be really good, but they get incredibly distorted because of sin. And both of those kinds of love are driven by selfish motivation. You love in a brotherly love kind of way and you love in an erotic kind of way by nature to get something for yourself, no matter how noble the thing is that you're trying to do. Because only God's love, agape love, is a self-sacrificing love and the scripture is clear in 1 John that only those who are in Christ have the capacity to love like that because they have received that kind of love from the Savior. And so we're talking about agape love, which is a volitional and selfless love that desires and works for the best interest of the one being loved, not the one loving. It's a self-denying focus that says to others, I give myself away for your benefit. I lay down my life for you, my friend, asking nothing. This is the point, asking nothing for myself. This kind of love is totally unconditional. It's totally unnatural. That's why it's called supernatural. When was the last time you took a dose of that kind of love? When was the last time you gave out a dose of that kind of love? You have that given to you, to use. And if our love is for ourselves, for our control or our comfort and well-being and our own objectives and our own success, we will not sacrifice ourselves for others or even for the Lord. In fact, it will be quite the opposite. We will view everyone, including the Lord, as a resource to be used for our own advancement and our own happiness. But if we will love with the supernatural self-sacrificing love of the Lord that he has given to us, then our lives will be centered on pleasing God and serving him and therefore seeking the welfare and meeting the needs of all of those around us. And at that point, you will be manifesting the fruit of the Spirit because you will supernaturally walk with the Spirit, living by the Spirit, and there's power in that kind of living. There is healing in that kind of living for all of your relational problems. And we... We are recipients. We've been speaking about this all morning long. We've been singing about it. How great, how great, how great is the love of God. Romans 5, 8. Because of his awesome love for you, here's how he displayed it. While you were still a sinner and you didn't deserve it, he sent his son to die for you. You deserve something a whole lot different than his love because of your sin. But while we were still sinners, he came and died for us. You and I because we're in Christ, have that capacity to love. And we have the ability to love the unlovely. We have the ability to love the undeserving. We have the ability to love those who have hurt us deeply. And you're like, no way. Nope. I'm going to shut you off right here, Phil, because you have no idea. You don't understand how much pain this person has caused me. You don't understand how deeply I have been sinned against. You don't understand the mistreatment and the abuse that I've had to endure over the years. You don't understand how many times my heart has been ripped out of my chest and thrown on the ground and stomped on over and over and over. I will never, ever open my heart to someone again. I will never be able to get rid of this fear of relationships because of too many bad things have happened in my life. Let me say something to you with all, with all compassion, all the compassion I have for your situation and for your past, but that kind of thinking is not of God. God hasn't given you that kind of thought. God has given you the spirit of power and love. And it's supernatural. God can love through you. And you can rise up and overcome what's been said to you or what's been done to you, no matter how wicked, no matter how evil, no matter how devastating. The prescription for fearing... I, 
you don't know how much I need this message. You don't know how much I'm preaching to myself today. But the prescription for fearing the fallout of relational failure is love. This is the only remedy for a broken heart and a broken life. It's the only way forward. I want you to watch this video. They left him lying in the street in the gutter. What's the address of your emergency? In Thomasville. Somebody looked like they've been shot in the head. Laying on the ground. People around till they heard a gunshot. I don't hate you. I can't hate you. It's not our way. Showing Rahma, mercy, that is our way. And you were a baby, and you are still a child. His death was already ordained. Maybe the purpose is to save your life, because you're not going to be killed by this society. My family would like very much to be a part of your seeing a better way of life so that this does not repeat itself because I will always be a part of your life. Any life that you take is not just one life. It is all that is connected to that life. What we want for them is not revenge. Revenge solves nothing. It will not bring back my son. And if I do, I want to say I'm sorry. You can only see how to help them when you have forgiven truly from your heart. I want you to listen carefully. If this Muslim woman, out of devotion and obedience to her false God and her false religion, can overcome fear and hate because of the tragic thing that has happened, then certainly you and I, who possess all the power and love of the one and only true and living God to supernaturally love and forgive, can love and forgive through even the worst of relational problems and fears, even the worst of things that have happened to us in our lives. He's given us power, my friends, for our circumstances. He's given us love for our relationships. And so you can fill it in because I just can't spend time here and I'm sorry, but he's given a sound judgment for our hearts and minds. Your Bible might say self-control, self-discipline, sound mind, but here it is. God has given us the supernatural ability to think clearly and to act sensibly when our hearts and minds are weak because of the uncertainty of our future. Many times we get overwhelmed with the uncertainty and the course that our lives are on, right? 
but he has given us a self-controlled and settled mind that says, verse 12 of 2 Timothy chapter 1, I know the one in whom I trust, and I am sure that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until the day of his return. This is the peace that passes all understanding that will keep and guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. One commentator described a settled mind in this way. I know who Jesus is. I know and I trust in God's word. I know truth from lies, light from darkness, right from wrong. I know what God's promised about the future and I know how all this ends and I know what I will enjoy for all eternity. I'm in my right mind, and you are too, and if you're struggling with thoughts that you can't go on and you can't handle any, it anymore, that's not from God. God has not given you that kind of thinking. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he has been, you have been supernaturally given a mind that rises above that kind of thinking. Let me just close with this. God has not given you the spirit of fear. In fact, let's just stand and let me declare this over you, okay? As we go today. God has not given you the spirit of fear. But he has supernaturally given you, supernaturally given you power. The same power that went to work and raised Jesus from the dead. He has supernaturally given you love. The same love that God put in play when he sent his one and only son to die for us. And he has given you supernaturally a settled mind, sound judgment to assure us that all his promises are true, that he is sovereignly in control of your every move, that he will never leave you or forsake you, and that in the end, he will make all things new. I want you to walk in that power today. God wants you, forget me, God wants you to walk in that power today. God wants you to walk in that truth. He wants you to speak that truth into your situation today. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. And we're so thankful, Lord. We're so thankful that you would speak this over us today. And some of us are hurting, I know, right now. Some of us are in pain. Some of us are struggling. Some of us are fearful. Some of us are actually found ourselves on the wrong side of the fruit of fear. And we need your help. They need your help to relight the fuse of your dynamic power at work in us so that we can live on the victory side of all of this stuff that causes us fear and pain and distrust. We don't want to be like that, Lord, and but many of us here today need your help. So would you, by your spirit, bring the help and empower us to walk in this truth and use us, in spite of our brokenness, Lord, <laughs> in spite of our fickleness, and in spite of the fact that we're not like your son, Jesus Christ, but desperately trying to be more and more like him on a daily basis, would you just use us for your honor and for your glory? And it's in Jesus' powerful name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, thanks for your patience um, this morning. And I, I just would uh, invite anyone who needs prayer over your circumstance. Maybe you're at this point where I don't know where to go. I don't know where to turn. We can help you. We can pray over your circumstance um, we would love to do that. Our prayer team will be down here. Or any other need you have, those of you who are online, thank you for joining us. You can uh, touch down with us and connect with us at any time. God bless you as you go in the power and strength of the Holy Spirit of God. Thank you so much for joining us for this morning's online service. 
Our hope is that it ministered to your heart deeply, and we pray that it inspires you to love God, love people, and influence our world with the gospel of Christ. If you made a spiritual decision today, or you'd like prayer in your life, we'd invite you to fill out an online connection card by clicking on the link. If you haven't downloaded our church app yet, now's a great time. It has tons of resources and opportunities that you can take advantage of. Finally, you can check out our website, fbclcart.org, to stay connected with us. We hope you have a great week, everybody, and we'll see you right back here next week, same time.